Hello. Our story begins in the unknown regions, where the remnants of the Galactic Empire were mounting up. The Battle of Jakku had come and gone. The once strong empire was left in disunion, and in the midst of chaos rose the New Republic. The decadent hope for a change that wouldn't come had surviving Imperial loyalists angered. Their empire had fallen, their emperor murdered by the last of the Jedi, and everything they had spent their entire lives believing in was gone. While there were warlords who would challenge the might of the Alliance, such as Moff Gideon, Captain Pelion, and Morgan Elsbeth, the majority of the Remnant vanished into the Unknown Regions. It was here, far away from the war being waged with the Shadow Council in the New Republic, where the blueprints for the First Order were born. A title for this new regime was not crafted, rather it was a call to action for heroes of the Imperial cause. Brendel Hux, one of the leaders behind the operation called Necromancer, had a large part in the construction of the Imperial movement to wipe out the New Republic. Without proper support from the galaxy, this empire needed to grow from strength. Palpatine had always been adamant on presenting a strong force, and while it was in the place of Imperial officers to challenge the judgment of the Emperor, they were now. Operation Cinder was a nightmare, seeing not just Imperial troops killed by their own weapons, but mass mutiny. This was among several other problems that erupted for the former Empire following Endor. Jakku, the Civil War of Coruscant and the crumbling of the power structure were among some of the other problems that were at the top of their lists for most damaging to their cause. Regardless, while the Shadow Council was following the lead of Moff Gideon, Brendel Huck started to operate outside of his own mandate. Sure, he was an incredibly important piece to the rebirth of their Emperor, but he knew that for a strong Empire to return, they needed a fighting force that was capable of withstanding the New Republic Freedom Fighters. This took the aging Imperial officer back to a time when he was a much younger man. He was a junior officer within the Grand Army of the Republic, assisting Jedi Generals with communicating tactics and strategies. But the Jedi were not his main concern. There was something else, much more alluring to Brendel. The idea of another clone army. These things have been passed around within Imperial circles ever since Order 66. The Emperor was especially adamant that resurrecting the clone army would never happen. It simply wasn't cost effective for the Galactic Empire. Or at least, that's what Palpatine always said as an excuse. Brendel believed that there could always be a way to combine Imperial tech with what they had stolen from the Kaminoans to rebuild an Imperial clone army. There was another driving factor for Brendel. There had been an experiment done within the last decade of Imperial reign. They were testing out a new motive in recruitment. Sometime after Order 66, a grouping of about 1,200 infants and children were brought into an Imperial hidden base. These kids were trained from birth to be soldiers. Palpatine was testing out an extension of what the Kaminoan cloning was. The only difference was the fact that all these children were individuals brought in from around the galaxy, not cloned from a single individual. The experiment with these young stormtroopers and cadets came to a close with the loss at Endor. While the results were lost to time, they apparently weren't, which is why Brendel was able to get his hands on the results of the experiment. As it turned out, the 1200 stormtroopers had a hard time maintaining loyalty. Brendel understood the circumstances, especially after Endor. They were unlikely and something the trainers could not prepare for, but for so many individuals raised from birth to be truly loyal to the Empire, so few of them remained as such. A good number of these stormtroopers betrayed their officers and executed them. Those who didn't side with their little uprising were either killed in a firefight or imprisoned. The troopers responsible for this insurgency vanished into the galaxy to either aid the rebellion or find their families. This left Brendel with a fear. Many within the Remnant were considering the idea of doing the strategy on a larger scale. If they hadn't gotten the results back from the test, then they would have gone forward with harvesting the galaxy's young and preparing them for combat in the future. Had they gone forward with their strategy to harvest infants from the galaxy, they would have struck a blow to the heart of famous Alliance General Lando Calrissian. His daughter would have been captured by the First Order. Instead of going down this path, the Imperial Warlords working in tandem with Hux listened to his concerns. Brendel had an illegitimate son named Armitage Hux, who Brendel didn't really care for and abused truthfully. He referenced this son as his reason for why the Empire should turn away from using child soldiers. They were weak, they were feeble, and they wouldn't ever amount to anything. 
If Armitage could come from Commanded Hux himself, then what was to come from the scum of the galaxy? They needn't waste their time with an experiment that had already proven its ineffectiveness. It was time to return to the cloning works of the Kaminoans long gone. These warlords eventually agree with Brendel's stance, because they were fully committed to recreating an army like the one that transformed the Republic into an empire. They retraced the steps to the fallen Jedi, Darth Tyrannus. This led them to finding and hiring a gunrunner from Concord Dawn. While the individual wasn't the most talented gunslinger in the galaxy, it was impossible to find anyone else. Boba Fett, the clone of Jango, was running an operation out on Tatooine after killing Cad Bane. Their best bet was the gunrunner from Concord Dawn. Inside of the unknown regions, Ilum would be turned into the cloning facility for the future First Order. With several warlords losing their lives to the New Republic and the galaxy starting to finally see change, the cloning facilities were constructed. They paled in comparison to what the Kaminoans were capable of nearly 40 years beforehand, but they would have to suffice. The genome was taken out of the gunrunner and they began their cloning operations. This included using a number of tests to figure out the best and most direct result towards victory. Because the inhibitor chip program was created for control and manipulation, Brendel and his scientists decided to avoid going down this route. The purpose of these clones wasn't to have extra commands to ensure their loyalty. Their purpose, their sole lot in life, was to fight and die for the greater good of the Empire. Despite the quality of cloning facilities on Ilum being poorer than Kamino, they had more room to operate. With the Empire growing its military and preparing for its final counters, Brendel watched this facility grow exponentially. Once the initial tests were complete, giving them proof that they should continue forward with this plan, they began their cloning process. The major difference between First Order clones and Kaminoan clones were their genetic makeup. Those born on Kamino, while being conditioned to be soldiers, had actual personalities. The facilities on Starkiller base were created to destroy any sense of humanity held by these clones. Not only their conditioning being harder, but the First Order didn't have inhibitor chips or accelerated aging. The reasoning is, inhibitor chips were not necessary for their cause, and the second being, the fact that they couldn't figure out how to accelerate the age of a clone. It was a simple human aging, and that would be fine for them. As the First Order started to sprout in the wreckage of the Imperial Remnant, other Imperial groups started to show themselves. For example, a group called the Corporate Sector Authority was regrowing in the Outer Rim. One of the officers serving with the long-standing Imperial group was Future General Pride. Now, Corporate Sector Authority was a group around since the Empire, a group of Imperials that worked outside the Empire itself. The cannon fodder that weren't high enough rank to be members of the Imperial Army, the cannon fodder's cannon fodder. This group wasn't what Brendel wanted to be a part of, the future First Order. Imperial warlords started to relish in the failures of the New Republic. They started tearing down their navy, reducing the size of the military. It was a gradual sign of their eventual decay in the eyes of individuals like Brendel. However, there was one thing that needed to remain, the Empire itself and those loyal to its cause. They needed to keep their stormtroopers. It didn't matter how strong or weak they were, they needed troopers to maintain their operations, individuals that could be replaced once the clone army was finished. With the Kaminoans all but extinct, the facility on Starkiller started to sprout with thousands of infant clones being created and beginning their instruction. Life for these clones wouldn't even be comparable to that of the ones that served the Grand Army the Republic. While their genome host was the gunrunner from Conquer Dawn, the Empire would inflict torture onto those who broke free. The conditioning of the Kaminoan facilities were seen as cruel for their demeanor towards their property, but Kaminoan operations paled in comparison to the cruelty of Imperial work. Officers who held any sort of power exerted it in an over-exaggerated way. Clone children, especially within the first few years of this project, were subjugated to torture. If a free thought sprouted out of their minds, it was beaten out of them, physically and mentally. Tactics used by the late great Dr. Hemlock were also utilized here. While much of what he did at Tantus was covered up by Governor Tarkin, what wasn't was used here. Hemlock's interest in super clones, similar to that of Clone Force 99, were a key inspiration for this group. The X-Series clones were also a key interest for the growing First Order. These weren't just clones, but sentient drones. They had no personality, they were stripped of their humanity, and it was done at an early age. On the clone side of things, 
They viewed Imperial officers with disdain. The only true trust for any clone was their commanders and their unit leaders, the ones that were actual clones. But those who excelled during their developmental years often were tortured to lose what made them clones, something to steal their brotherhood from each other. Something the First Order identified as a cause for concern was how the Grand Army of the Republic had clones that identified as clones. This identification, this brotherhood, was an issue for the eventual Empire. Clones rebelled because they saw their brethren hurt by a rising regime. This could not be allowed to happen here with the First Order. So, brain and memory wipes became commonplace. Enhancement of mental torture forced clones to lose their identity with what made them clones. These torture sessions forced them to stop viewing themselves as clones. The mindless drone persona became commonplace on Starkiller. And while there were those that hid their personalities, they eventually subconsciously became loyal to the First Order. Every member of this clone army was born and bred on Starkiller base. This meant that they only knew the pain of their officers through their officers. Human, non-clone members of the Imperial Hierarchy told the clones everything they needed to know. A group of horrid insurgents killed their emperor, the Jedi were evil, the New Republic paled in comparison to the Empire, and their revenge would be justified. Clones from a young age were taught to accept Imperial rule as natural. The state of the galaxy was reliant on their loyalty. These clones were shown horrific battles during war, such as Mimban, where Imperial army troopers were subjugated to a planet of people, people that killed thousands of Imperials and, well, even more locals were killed in the battle. This death, destruction, and total war became a numb spot to these clones. They didn't view it as bad, it was natural, Imperial rule was natural, and it had to return. In 32 ABY, two years before the Hosnian Cataclysm, the First Order's clone army was ready. The first batch of 2 million troopers were ready to go, and as per the First Order's request, they were sent out into the unknown regions to besiege every planet they could. At this point, Brendel had been assassinated by Captain Phasma and his son, Armitage Hux. Phasma was a recruit from the First Order, one for a trooper that could lead the clone army without influence from any cloning. The reason they chose Phasma to lead this army was because of her military experience, while the army itself was incubating. Donning First Order armor, the clone army marched on unsuspecting worlds. The First Order was the new empire. With Kylo Ren, Master of the Knights of Ren, and apprentice to Supreme Leader Snoke, the First Order went to war. Their walkers were new, their armor was shining, and their resolve was victory. General Hux, the son of Brendel, took command as the loyal pawn of Snoke. When Snoke ascended the ranks of the First Order, he took power from those with it, and killed anyone not willing to remain loyal. After a life of torture, Armitage was ready to serve as a rabid cur to the Supreme Leader. Also joining their ranks was former Corporate Sector Authority member General Pride. In the eyes of the First Order, anyone who did not don their colors were an enemy. Silently, the Unknown Regions fell into terror. Kylo Ren, the grandson of Darth Vader, was a fierce warrior, and with the true army behind him, he reveled in the power that made Anakin Skywalker such a threat. Kylo, in one of their battles, was even able to kill the mighty Zillow Beast on his own. This movement was one of untamed power, untapped potential, and determination not seen since the formation of the Galactic Empire. Snoke's military reflected its leader. Kylo and the clones were unstoppable. Destroying the CSA was a step in the right direction. Capturing the unknown regions was a victory, but true accomplishment was yet to come. Because the clones were so effective, the First Order moved on the new galaxy, striking up a foothold in the Outer Rim and catching the attention of New Republic outposts that were wiped out within a single cycle. This movement caught wind on Hosnian Prime, where the bureaucracy of the New Republic decided to send its polished military, one that was pretentious at worst and unskilled at best. The New Republic was arrogant, nothing would challenge their command over the galaxy. They, along with their Chancellor and several other wealthy investors, went into the Outer Rim with the military. Kylo Ren's resurging class Star Destroyer, the Finalizer, was stationed alone. The New Republic came in with four cruisers, while the main ground force was sent to the surface to stop the military that had come in and wiped out the New Republic base present on the planet. Those with the Chancellor sat inside their space yacht, served with hot bocha, with glasses of the finest liqueur from the fields of the greatest refineries in the Inner Rim. They sat their presumptuous selves down, 
so they could watch the New Republic claim victory. A reserve fleet sat behind the yacht just in case anything bad happened, but they were not prepared for what was the amazing power of the finalizer. The New Republic called out to the Star Destroyer, telling it to surrender, and it slowly came into range of their four cruisers. As they were preparing to board the vessel and capture it, news came from the ground. Republic forces were ambushed by stormtroopers. The clones ran into action, slaughtering the New Republic Freedom Fighters. Stormtroopers charged into the field of battle, crippling any sort of vehicles the New Republic brought in to knock out whatever it was they believed was a small resistance. The Knights of Ren were on the surface, and per their master's request, they snuck around the back side of the flank and crippled the gunships used to deploy the Republic fighters. In space, Kylo Ren sat inside of his TIE silencer and waited. Once the heavy cannon started firing inside the finalizer, he launched from the hangar bay. As he exited, he could see from his peripherals, the four Republic ships crumbled. The finalizer pressed its engines forward and unleashed a horrid barrage of fire onto the New Republic cruisers. Their shields were the most they could offer in any form of a fight, but the resurgent didn't even buckle. Its shields held strong and its turbo cannons unloaded everything they had into the Republic fighting force. Inside his yacht, the Chancellor stood up in dismay, watching his fleet burn up. He called to the Admiral to bring the reinforcements in, and the other vessels moved forward. Kylo sped his TIE silencer forward and buzzed the bridge of the yacht, to show superiority to the Chancellor. The panic of the New Republic could not be overstated, as they tried to fix the situation by sending destroyers and cruisers after the Star Destroyer. They were met with terror because of this. The finalizer crushed through the original four cruisers with little effort, and when all felt like the New Republic would rally, out of hyperspace dropped Captain Kennedy's Dreadnought and two other resurgent class Star Destroyers. On the ground, the First Order troopers didn't even struggle. They were fierce warriors, and in their first true test against the New Republic, they showed up. Captain Phasma led her men against the Republic. Their soldiers were getting slaughtered, and as they tried to make a fighting retreat, their vehicles were destroyed by ATM-6 walkers. The Republic fighters made their way to their gunships, but they couldn't escape, and the First Order wasn't taking prisoners, leaving the clones to complete another series of executions on the ground. With contact from their ground general being cut out, the New Republic pulled back and prepared for a retreat. A Home 1 type Mon Calamari cruiser, the first rate of the Republic fleet, held off the First Order. Its shields didn't even buckle, but General Hux ordered Captain Kennedy to open fire. The Dreadnought's heavy weapons lifted up and unloaded a heavy barrage into the underbelly of the Home 1 type vessel. The MC ship split into pieces as the finalizer pressed forward. X Wings that were in the space battle tried to hold off the assault from Ren, but it didn't work. The Chancellor escaped before the rest of the New Republic did. Right before they could completely escape the planet, the Dreadnought unloaded another heavy shot into the hull of a Republic destroyer, completely ripping it to shreds, leaving the Republic with another excruciating loss. By the end of the battle, the casualties for the First Order were only 130 clones, in comparison to 918 Republic soldiers on the ground, ones that could be counted at least. In space, the First Order didn't even lose a TIE fighter. It was an absolutely dominating victory. Not that TIE fighter pilots were great by any means, simply put, Kylo Ren was an amazing pilot and his flanking TIEs never got shot out of the sky. With true victory for the First Order, a war could begin. The New Republic fled back to Hosnian Prime to address the Senate, which involved calling upon Leia Organa Solo to come in and aid with this fight. After having removed herself out of the Senate for being related to Darth Vader, thanks to some political rivals, she reluctantly returned. She was called a warmonger, but she was right. The Empire was a threat, even if they couldn't be seen, and the late Chancellor Mon Mothma couldn't act on something that simply wasn't visible. Now, the First Order was visibly a true threat. This wasn't the first time the New Republic had been shown up, and they needed to do something about this. Leia called for the rebirth of the Alliance fleet. She, General Sundula, and Admiral Akbar could take charge. Captain Dameron would also be able to lead the fighter fleet. She could bring this New Republic to a victory, but they needed support from the Senate itself. A Chancellor, terrified by what he had seen, agreed, calling for the New Republic to react, which it didn't. However, Leia was worried about what her son had gotten into. She, Luke, and Han knew that Snoke's influence was all over this. Luke had since vanished, blaming himself for Ben's turn, when Han and Leia never blamed him to begin with. The real issue for the Republic was its lack of preparation. It was similar to the Old Republic during the Separatist Insurgency. 
the rise of a confederacy movement with a full-blown army, but back then there were 10,000 Jedi and a clone army ready to save them. Now the Jedi were gone, Kylo was the Jedi killer, and the little military the New Republic had was more of a glorified police force. Leia became obsessed with finding her son. He was out there somewhere and she wanted to bring him home. With actual battle lines forming in the Outer Rim, both from New Republic soldiers and fleets as well as citizen militias, the war with the First Order began. While Starkiller still had some time to finish construction, the clone army continued fighting against the militia and the New Republic. For the next two years, up until 34 ABY and the finished construction of Starkiller, the war was going terribly for the New Republic. The Republic lost ground exponentially, and the First Order clone army proved how useful it was. There were some troubles that started to arise within the clone army though. One of their captains had discovered information on the former army of the Republic. The only reason this was possible was because of their placement in the Outer Rim. The Grand Army of the Republic came from the Outer Rim, specifically Kamino. That fact was unnerving because a part of their conditioning was that there had never been a clone army before this. This information also went deeper. The clones started to realize, aside from not being the first Grand Army of clone troopers, that their treatment was unsettling. The only reason this was realized was because a group of stormtroopers were captured by New Republic forces. They were treated fairly and not tortured. Because of this, they saw that their enemies may have not been as cruel as they once believed them to be. First Order non-clone officers told their troopers that they were treated fairly, explaining that the New Republic would never recognize them as actual people. But the New Republic, under General Leia Organa Solo, had learned about this clone army. She was the reason why the captured clones were freed and returned to their base. It was a gut reaction on her part, but a smart one in her opinion. Just like her father, she was very caring towards the clones, ironically. It worked too. Her generosity helped the clones feel real. The soldiers who watched over the captured stormtroopers asked them about themselves per Leia's request. The sheer humanity in the New Republic ranks made the captured clones wonder why they hadn't ever been treated fairly by their own officers. Those captured by the New Republic were tortured by the First Order when they returned home. This created trouble for clones across their ranks, especially the front lines. Midway through the first year of this war, mother and son came face to face on a battlefield. Leia wasn't even in the fight. It was a surprise attack on a Republic base. Kylo led his forces into the main base, and as he cut through the resistance, he came across his mother. With his troops faring into the base without their leader, they were pushed back. A Wookiee task force led by Ni and Nub led a strong resistance against the First Order troopers. Inside the command center, Leia asked her son why he was doing this. Behind the mask, Kylo struggled. He had seen his mother as this pure being, an individual that in his mind could do no wrong and it broke him. Kylo didn't want to take off his mask, but his mother demanded that he do it. He wanted to know what she would see if he did, and she exclaimed that she would see the face of her son. Kylo's mask fell off of his head and dropped to the ground. Ben looked at his mom and the love in her eyes hadn't changed. No matter what he did or who he believed he became, she only saw Ben Solo. That realization hit him like a ton of bricks. He stammered and she stepped forward, feeling and seeing his hesitation. There was almost nothing he could do. His mother asked for his lightsaber and they could leave this all behind. The First Order, Snoke, this war against the Republic, it could all end right now. He shook his head, he couldn't. He had done so much wrong. As he took his lightsaber off his belt, he prepared to place it into his mother's hand when an explosion rocked the room open and they were thrown apart. Kylo grabbed his mask in a panic and tightened it over his head as he led the fighting retreat from the Republic forces, finally finding their own ground victory. Outside of this, Ben struggled with remaining loyal to Snoke. His master was an abuser, but his mother welcomed him back without even a shred of resistance. She loved him no matter what, and that troubled him, stopping Kylo from leading assaults on the front lines. By 34 ABY, he was planning to run far away, return to the Republic or to his mother, and find his place with his home. There was adversity with him and his uncle, but that could be resolved, hopefully. At the same time that Ben was struggling as Kylo Ren, the First Order had its first show of rebellion. The clones had spent two years learning about the greatest cover-up in Imperial history. Warlords, officers, generals, and Snoke had hidden every piece of information about the history of cloning. 
The history of the Clone Army went back to not just the First Order, but the Empire and the Republic of Old. This movement, this army, was not the first of its kind, but it was the first of its kind to be berated in such a horrid treatment. During the Clone Wars, there were those who wronged the clones, treated them as if they weren't human, but they were silenced by the Jedi specifically. While the Jedi weren't around anymore, many clones who learned of this news wondered what would have been had they been raised during the Republic era. What would have happened had General Hux executed his own version of Order 66? They didn't have inhibitor chips, but they didn't know that. Their position felt divisive. Did they want to serve a First Order that wanted to do what was done to them to the galaxy? Did they want to spread their torture to others? The treatment captured clones received from the New Republic was a massive contrast to what the clones received from the First Order. This was not something that they wanted to continue passing on. Two years of vicious fighting had done this to the frontline clones. They weren't killing or fighting droids, they were slaughtering civilians, killing troopers and soldiers. Their war wasn't just a generational one, but one that would determine the direction of the galaxy. The First Order was entrenched in the Outer Rim. Their battle lines directly affected the lives of a couple billion sentients. This truly determined the direction of the clone army. As their own captains and sergeants mounted up a resistance against the First Order, Kylo Ren abandoned Snoke and returned to a neutral world, one where he wanted to meet his mother alone. Mother and son reunited on Endor, a place Ben had been to numerous times, a place that he held fond memories for his mother. When they met, Ben was sitting on a log. He was overlooking the moss-covered wreckage of the shield generator that his father destroyed. In the meantime, the First Order was tracking down Lord Sentaka to Jakku to find the map that led to Luke Skywalker. But it wasn't just the map, it was a New Republic trap, one meant to encourage the patriotism of the New Republic. If they could win again at Jakku, then they could prove that their movement was unbeatable. With First Order clones getting hit hard by Republic forces, an uprising began on Starkiller at the same time. There were rumors about the potential targeting of the Hosnian system, one that would kill billions of sentients with one blast in just a few seconds. The planet-sized weapon was preparing to eat a star as well, hence the name. If Starkiller was allowed to fire, then the First Order would rip the hope from the galaxy. With Kylo Ren seemingly gone, and the Supreme Leader eagerly waiting for a chance to take his throne in the galaxy, the clones rose up. On the base itself, the cloning facilities erupted. Due to their stripped brotherhood, the clone resistance was fighting for the people that were to be wrong. This came from a place in their hearts of thwarting oppression. They didn't want the galaxy to go through what they had suffered through, and so they struck. A battlefield erupted on the surface of Starkiller. Supreme Leader Snoke was informed about this immediately, and he sent reinforcements to stop it from continuing. The lack of brotherhood within the clones allowed them to straight up kill each other. The rebellion ripped through the First Order lines, as experienced warriors were able to kill the freshly released Shinies. The clones from Starkiller tried to hold their lines, but they faltered. With Captain Phasma entrenched in a battle on Jakku, the forces of evil and Starkiller were left without a true leader. The First Order officers tried to quell the violence, but they were, too, killed in the rebellion. With war unfolding across the surface of the planet, the rebel stormtroopers were able to make their way to the reactor and shut down the core, not killing the planet or the base, but completely disabling the weapon of Starkiller. As the battle continued to progress, they were able to fully destroy the weapon without killing themselves in the process. While the clones had no true brotherhood with each other, when the rebel clones won, they did not hurt their brothers. They did not subjugate them to torture, they simply captured them and imprisoned them. Out on Jakku, the finalizer was blindsided by an attack group led by Vice Admiral Holdo and her bombing fleet. The good friend of General Organa and the hero of Chiron Belt led the New Republic in command of her frigate. It may have not been the largest vessel in the fleet, but size of ships had never been a rebel advantage. Their bombing forces hit the First Order fleet and eradicated their engines and their shields, giving time for the smaller, lighter, and faster cruisers and frigates to avoid the heavy cannons of the First Order fleet. On the ground, Jakku, Poe Dameron was able to get to his X-Wing and take off, fleeing the victory on the surface and leading the fighter assault on the heavy First Order cruisers. The First Order may have seemed defeated, but Supreme Leader Snoke was not. He remained elusive. With a student betraying him, he would go to torture him from a galaxy away, using his connection to Ben to plague him with insufferable nightmares. Ben was kept away from the Republic forces and pretty much everyone else for a good couple weeks, 
This was because of the nightmares, but also because he feared what would happen to him if they saw him. The Outer Rim conflict with the First Order started to slip away. While it wasn't a result of Jakku, the New Republic believed it was, so that was their arguing point, their propaganda point. They won at Jakku again. Join the New Republic and secure the galaxy again. Leia had to step back from the conflict, which meant new faces took her position in the form of Vice Admiral Holdo and Admiral Akbar, not to mention Commander Dameron and General Sandula and a couple other freedom fighters. The New Republic dove in after the First Order. With a trail of breadcrumbs from the rebellion clone movement, they flew in after their opponents, but Snoke and his forces had vanished. The truth is, the New Republic was welcomed by the Outer Rim and Unknown Regions. Both sectors of the galaxy had been choked out by the First Order for too long, and the Republic Freedom Fighters and fleets descended on the oppressed. The First Order, on the other hand, would simply vanish, and the New Republic refused to believe it, but ironically, this time it was actually the truth. Following the loss of Starkiller and the eventual capture of it by the New Republic, the First Order searched for reinforcements. Snoke, not being a Sith, was obsessed with their power, and it led him and his forces to Exegol. He would be overwhelmed by the truth of his creation. That led to another conflict. Snoke found Palpatine, and not just the age-old Sith Lord, but the laboratories that ended up creating Snoke himself. Snoke and Sidious would turn against each other, and it would result in not just the destruction of the Sith, but the disbanding of the First and Final Orders. A civil war that consumed the last of the Empire died on the hidden Sith world. The New Republic never learned about this, and they, unlike the Empire, rewarded the clones for their valor, especially those who betrayed the First Order to inform them of everything they knew. While paranoia ran rampant within the Senate, the truth was, the Sith and the Empire were destroyed. Ben and Han had their reunion, and it was beautiful. Ben tried so hard to be someone he wasn't, and with his mother and father, he would be home again. It would be Ben that went to Ahch too, finding Luke Skywalker before he ever destroyed the original Jedi Temple, and they reconciled. Ben understood that Luke never wanted to kill him, and never even attempted to do so. He was deceived by a lie, they all were, and that wasn't Ben's fault. The Republic had room to grow, and his pain for restructuring and the scare of the First Order would lead to that. Leia would be reinstated and those who used her connection to Vader as political warfare lost their roles inside the Senate itself. The New Republic, thanks to their fleet and troop placements, would begin to colonize the Unknown Regions and finally bring them into the New Republic. As for the Jedi, they would be reborn, but not of Luke. He'd pass on everything he learned to Ben, who would make it his life's work to undo what he had done. Luke's belief that the Jedi were the root of all pain in the galaxy was wrong, and he had to learn that, not just from Ben, but from the Force Ghost of Yoda. Ben's reborn order would take time, just like the New Republic, but the first member of said order would be a scavenger from Jakku. Following her, it would be a Mandalorian of the same species as Yoda. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to all of our patrons. Benjamin Wells, Ozpin, Angel Dust, Alexander Reese, The Beginning and End, Darth Vitiate, Seiju Jagger, Groot36, Hunter Belden, Rosebird, Django Fett Clone, Nick5098, Ben Ingram, The Big Red Pure Mark, Down and Constant, Darth Nemesis, Lord Tib, CC2024, Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Mandalore, Sir William1767, Darth Revan, Granny Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Cully Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Weebus 670, Anika Stank Runner, CT7567, Twister Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, John Nguyen, Sansa Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Kelly, Galen 66, Man Man Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Dragon, Forward 66 Star Wars, Airbus, Rex the Wolf, Me Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing. For supporting the channel, smash that like button. I am streaming Star Wars Outlaws on Twitch. Check that out. Oh, I, I, I like that. Yeah, I like it too. Yeah, it goes boom boom. Otherwise, let's talk about this story. So I like the idea of having this clone movement for the First Order kind of be what the Clone Republic movement wasn't able to be just because of, you know, how the trilogies are set up. I thought it was cool to kind of explore how the clones would be treated worse than they were on Kamino and how pushing so hard would push the clones in another direction. In Nemec's manifesto, he says that like authority is brittle, you know, tyranny is, is fragile. The whole purpose of this tyranny is to show how inferior it really is. And so the First Order is trying so hard to be the Empire and they're trying so hard to subjugate these people and the clones are groomed into it but they just, when they get their first taste of freedom or their first taste of the actual galaxy, they see that it's not what they were told it was and that lie 
that concrete lie and foundation is what leads to their betrayal of the First Order. So I hope you all enjoyed this kind of Clone Rebellion First Order story. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the Force be with you. <laughs>